Well, hello there. Live from Kingbridge Collaboration Institute in King City, Ontario, I'm Susan Radojevic, and this is Corner Office. The headlines read, EU drops female board quotas plan. Canada, our time to lead women in power. We need female board quotas because men aren't listening. Research shows that conceivably one billion women from both developing and industrialized nations will be in the global marketplace by 2020. And their presence will impact global business significantly. Results from a 2012 study conducted by Catalyst Inc., an organization dedicated to building inclusive workplaces and expanding opportunities for women in business, shows in the Canadian labor force, women represent 47.3%. 37% are in management roles, 17.7% are senior officers, 14.5% are board directors, and 6.1% are CEOs and heads of organizations. And as of July 2012, there are 30, count them folks, 30 women CEOs in Canada. The source for these statistics is the Financial Post. Norway, France, Iceland, and Spain have introduced quotas to encourage organizations to get more women on corporate boards and in top jobs. Switzerland, Israel, and South Africa have quotas for government-owned organizations. And closer to home, in 2006, Jean Charest, then Premier of Quebec, insisted that more women be appointed to provincial Crown Corporation's boards, requiring 50% of board seats to be held by women by 2011. As a result, in Quebec, female board representation is up from 27.5% in 2006 to 52.4% today. Joining me to explore the role of government and governance in this conversation is Peggy Nash, NDP member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park Electoral District in Toronto. In addition to her role as the official opposition shadow cabinet as the finance critic, Peggy has been involved with many organizations advancing women's equality. She is a founding member of Equal Voice, an all-party organization which advocates for the election of more women in Canada. And also on the show today is our very own Corner Office Explorer and blog contributor, Shirley Knight of Shirley M. Knight and Associates. In addition to Shirley's affiliation with Corner Office, Shirley is an independent consultant with more than 30 years experience in banking and insurance and specializing in strategic planning, leadership, and organizational development. Shirley believes organizations with gender balance have a business advantage. Nice to have you both on the show today. Great Happy to be here. Thanks. And very interesting, before we even went on air, these two discovered that they went to school together. Like, like grade three or something? Grade, grade three, grade three. Yes. Grade three. Yes. Grade three. Grade it is a small world, isn't it? It really is. Well, now before we get the conversation started, a few rules of engagement. After all, Corner Office is about having an informal creative process where meaningful outcomes can and do co-evolve. So, if you are watching us online and would like to weigh in, please use the chat tab found on your screen. If you are following us on our Twitter hashtag, CoLive, or our agency's handle, at Peregrine Agency, post your question using these channels, and we'll make sure we get to your questions. Okay, with our engagement channels open, let's get started. In 2011, a record 76 women were elected to the House of Commons. There are five female premiers. Last week, two women threw their hats into the ring for the Ontario Liberal leadership race. And 21.1% of all politicians elected provincially and territorially in legislation and parliament 
are women. So my question, Peggy, to you first is, what is the difference if there were more women in politics? I think it would make a tremendous difference. The UN says that if you have 30% of women in uh, an organization and leadership positions, it creates a critical mass. And by that, they mean that it validates their voices, it validates their views, and prevents them from being marginalized. And I see that in Parliament. Uh, right now, in the federal parliament, we're at an all-time high at close to 25%. Um, our caucus has 40% women, which is, again, a, an all-time record. But if you look at the average, as you've said, across the country, even in municipal politics, it's down around 20%, one in five. Um, and what that means is, it tends to be a very male-dominated environment. Uh, it's seen as a very non-traditional job for women. And without trying to stereotype women, it, the, the concerns that women are more likely to raise around uh, perhaps being more concerned about health care, child care, um, uh, maybe equality in the workplace, these concerns will be more validated and will be more likely to be recognized and, and actually get some concrete results if you have more women elected. And from a governance standpoint of view, Sean? Well, I, I just wanted to ask Peggy a question first, if I could be far yeah. away in on anything. I just, what's it like uh, in a woman in politics? Like, it, it is such a male-dominated, I mean, you're throwing out numbers of 40%, which is pretty startling, and that's uh, remarkable. But that's kind of, that's but a big change. First time yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I think you were involved back in the day. So, so what what is it like for women in, in government, and, and how is the, ch it, now that you're building critical mass, has it changed? The yeah, experience? I would argue that we still don't have a critical mass yet. Yeah. In our in our caucus, we we do have more women, and I can t I can talk a bit about the difference that that makes because there are some interesting yeah. changes. But um, I I still see, especially uh, for young women, when they stand up to speak in the house, there's a lot more chatter that goes on with uh, with men and uh, you know some laughing I mean I I remember reading about uh, a woman MP standing up and talking about violence in the home back I think in the 1980s wow. and uh, men bursting out laughing as a result <laughs> that was the result of, of her raising that issue so it's that it's that climate that um, tends not to validate the concerns that women raise um, and can create kind of a locker room environment. And now people would say that's just how question period is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's... Uh, there's something in there, too. There's something there, too. Uh, you know, conflict is yeah. conflict, but yeah. you want to make sure that you're not... Um, silencing or negatively uh, affecting one group in particular, in this case women. Disrespecting their presence. Yeah, yeah. disrespecting their voice, yeah. because then you you lose that the value of that voice. Well, and this is, you know, now switching to, uh, to corporate governance, um, because you're actually um, losing productivity and opportunity and productivity. Australia found when they balanced um, the governance, uh, balance management teams and balance governance, they get a 12 percent rather increase in productivity right away. So it, it's it, it's startling actually, and it, it shouldn't be because it's not news that men and women get on well together. <laughs> That's not exactly a, a bolt of lightning, but um, but what you the concern is when you have that kind of environment where where people bring out a new idea and get laughed at. Mm -hmm. Like that's the worst thing that could ever happen to Canada, corporately, as a, as a government, as a society. That's the worst thing that could happen if new ideas get left at. And, and you know, the sort of, the, the opportunity of balancing, and to your point on critical mass, when you can actually start to shift that, um, by definition, more opportunity opens up. Yeah, I've heard it described as, uh, you know, walking around with one eye closed, there you're only go. getting half the picture, yeah. or seeing everything in black and white, when you could have it in full color. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> it's yeah. that you're not getting that full 
perspective, and I, uh, I hadn't heard that number before about productivity, but mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense. Yeah. You're not getting a full perspective. So you lose that. And from a yeah, ca Canadian does. standpoint of view, um, our productivity hasn't increased since the 70s. Big we really? have a huge yeah. problem with productivity, yeah. yes. So this is all, so not yeah. only is it the right move to get more women on boards and in top jobs, it's also the smart move. Mm -hmm. So my follow-up question would be, what would need to be true for the government to introduce female board quotas? They just reintroduced it yesterday, actually. Vivian Redding, who is the EU Justice Commissioner, um, mm. represented the proposal for the EU to get more uh, women on boards, um, and she presented 40%. She had to take out the fact that if, if companies didn't achieve the 40%, that there would be sanctions put against them and fines. <laughs> <laughs> so she had to kind of just water aggressive. it down a little bit. <laughs> but, um, but what about from our Canadian standpoint of view? We know that productivity is, is down. Yeah, we're down near the bottom of the OECD in we terms are. of productivity. And yeah. we know that we, you know, research and statistics show that having this gender balance and this critical mass works for us. So mm -hmm. what would we need to do? What, what would the government need to do? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think the way it's it's been done in other places is you have to you have to set a goal, but have it far enough out that companies can reach that goal realistically. The last thing you want is something that changes the rules midstream, and you end up with people being put on there who aren't qualified. What we know, there are women in leadership positions in governments in firms who have the qualifications, but y you, you have to prepare boards and you have to prepare those women to assume those roles. So I think allowing for a transition period is important because frankly, I'm in a lot of meetings where I look around and I'm the only gal at the table. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that there aren't qualified women out there, but you've got to have some preparation in order to get to your end point. You don't go from zero to 100 like that. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to prepare for it. But I think every time an organization like Catalyst, for example, puts out the statistics, and you just read some of them, mm -hmm. uh, you, you just uh, stated some of them about, I think it was 6% of yeah. the CEOs, CEOs are women. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's women. shocking. Yeah. That is shocking. Yeah. And yeah. what that tells, and, and I notice, for example, I, I, can I throw out a name? Yes, you, know? okay. you can do whatever you <laughs> like. <laughs> I, um, I periodically shop at the Bay, and yeah. Bonnie Brooks oh, yeah. is now yeah. the, the CEO at the Bay, and I think, man, does she know the target audience yeah. of women? And so for CEOs who want to reach a certain market, a segment of the population, you know, having that kind of leadership is so important. And, um, uh, you know, and it's, it's, I see young women, for example, mm -hmm. going to the Bay because they've got Topshop and they've got all of these young fashions there, but they've also, they've got a variety. Anyway, I, uh, my point is that she has transformed what was seen as kind of a sleepy, your granny's kind of a store <laughs> into something where, vibrant, you know, yeah. I needed a dress for an event and someone said, oh, go to the Bay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just think there's an example of how you can expand your market, build your business, increase productivity um, by having that, you know, a women's perspective. And it's kind of shocking that we have so few CEOs. So women CEOs. Like I totally, I agree with you totally. The only challenge I put to what you said is you said time out. Yes. I mean, this conversation, uh, I've been having it yeah, since why 19, wait, I guess 1995. <laughs> like I don't know about like we've been talking about this forever, and uh, mm -hmm. and you know what happened was I think we were all really shocked about the boards like the because we see so many like more women graduating from university than men. I mean, so yeah. there's there's more Lawyers. women out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, the medical profession, doctor side, not nurse side, doctor oh. side is becoming um, dominated by women. Like yeah. the, the, it's uh, so you think well, what's the problem? Well, um, nobody looked at the boards. Nobody has looked at boards because mm -hmm. this has been going on like and there's rules rules for how you get on a board yeah. So but what's happening is um, 
So now you're looking at it and you're shocked at the numbers. And you know, as am I, as, as are we all. But we've been shocked for a long time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, like I'm shocked that it's still like this because yeah. the dialogue has been so lively. Mm -hmm. But, but um, what's happening now though is the role of governance is, is changing because it has more rigor and more process to it now than it ever did before. Mm -hmm. And you know, the chair of the audit committee is one nervous guy now because uh, thank you Nortel for that. <laughs> because you know, now, now these, this is an accountable position. And um, so that's happening at the same time that the market is becoming more global. And so there's way more complexity in the market and more diversity in the marketplace as a, as a world uh, as well. So we've got um, uh, a situation where we need more, uh, more and different thinking desperately. Mm -hmm. And we need um, people who will f be process and rigorous and so on, and, and which you know, women prove that they do that a lot, mm -hmm. and um, and yet um, the lead time has been 25 years or 20 years. Maybe yeah. 25 is a bit harsh, but 20 years, and not much has happened at all. Like really, the the rate of women on board I don't think has changed in five or six years. Well, right. so and this is where I think government could help. I think government. The, who looks after the governance kind of thing? And governance looks after the company, and we figured that out, but who looks after the governance? And I think like even the threat of a quota would change the environment. And, but you know, to Norway's point, no, and to Jean Charest, I didn't know about that, so that was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, that it, it, it really does work when you do it. And I just, I just wonder what, you know. Well, he did it out to 2011. Like. Right, he yeah. didn't do that from, in 2010. From 2006. From 06. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah so exactly. That's what I'm saying. So that's is what you saying. have to gotcha. have just a period okay. five years uh, kind of, of. I mean, whether it's five years or three years, it's yeah. the, the period of term of gotcha. uh, of a board. So I'm not saying I let's let's that. plan yeah, this yeah. for another 25 years, and that's maybe what I'm worried you know, about. maybe our daughters or granddaughters <laughs> will benefit, or great granddaughters. Great, great granddaughters. Um, exactly. No, I'm saying you you can't say it's going to change and next year this will Got happen it. because Got the it. terms okay. of boards are are longer than that and um, there are lots of qualified women out there but we don't want to give anybody an excuse by saying oh if I have to do this by next year well okay you 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 and you yes. come on in you're going to oh, sit on perfect. a board because yeah, so, yeah, we've got yeah. lots of qualified women There's out there. Tons of them. Like, yeah, you know, an increase, uh, the increase has been how many women got on boards has been only 0.5% since 2009. Oh, wow. So, so it's even worse than what I said. Yeah. Oh, gosh. And, and oh, so could one of the reasons be because men are, not, men are at the helm, right? They're the ones that mm -hmm. are sit on boards and they decide who they're going to put on boards. Um, could it be that they are just not recognizing that this is important? It's not on their priority list? They don't see. They're not connecting the dots between the, the productivity increase and um, what women can bring to the table, uh, higher pro uh, stock prices and all that stuff. Uh, you know, it, could it be that they just don't see this as a as a starter? I I think when people act the way they act, my my opinion is it's perceived risk, and I think they, that they've locked down the board as how the board is, and there's a lot of white guys at the table. Like, and I think they've locked that down, and there there is. Um, a perceived risk, for example, you, you alluded to it actually, that you know, what if you hire, bring people onto the board who aren't qualified and aren't able, just in your quest for gender numbers. Um, so I think there's a perceived risk, and I'm not sure that there's an understanding the, the, the value that's left on the table. Mm -hmm. by, by, I'm not, I don't know that that understanding is out there, because mm -hmm. you're actually um, costing money to the company by not doing, like money is actually being lost because um, the, the board is the, the way, I don't think anybody directly connects that. I, I agree with you and I would actually even take it back a step further. I think it comes to the stereotypic perception mm -hmm. of what constitutes good leadership, what are the qualities of a leader, who is a leader, what does a leader look like? And I think there is a, uh, uh, an old-fashioned perception of this rugged individual white guy, <laughs> you know, old white guy who is the leader. John Wayne who? <laughs> yeah, and it is yeah, kind of the lone yeah, gunslinger yeah. kind of image. And but I'm sorry, but it didn't work for the election in the U.S. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work. And why? Because 
um, people were looking for something different and, right. and there's a growing yeah. diversity in the population as well. That's right. I mean, we have the most diverse population of the world. In the world, yeah, I think. Okay, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna piggyback on that. We do, so why aren't we open to putting in place quotas? Mm -hmm. If we do have, if we recognize that, and, and that's what the Canada is built on. Yeah, and I, I th that's a good point. And I think that people are saying, why can't we just get to this point yeah. naturally? Because yeah. why don't we recognize the diversity and the strength of our diversity? Which, you know, I used to be on the um, board of Invest Toronto, and part of how we market Toronto to the world is to say, we have this incredibly diverse population. That right is on. a strength. We're educated. We have these international connections. It's a good place to do business. So we recognize it, but we don't replicate it when it <laughs> comes to our leadership positions and to boards, to political positions. And we, we think it should happen automatically and that the best people will rise to the top, but we fail to acknowledge what I believe are systemic barriers. And part of it is, I'm going to recruit people who look like me. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that these, these cultural legacies from another time are, are, in, are significantly and powerful and largely invisible. Mm -hmm. They're just more or less accepted as that, that's the way it is. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they carry such power, like those qualified candidates just don't float to the top. There, there is no get to the top because, um, because there's something stopping it. It's like you've got a filter there that's, that's actually not allowing mm -hmm. that to happen. And it's really, that's really a great statement that they, they recognize it, but they don't replicate it. That's just well, a great mm -hmm. statement. One of the, so true. One of the challenges I, um, when I was doing this research that I found is that the, the organizations that do recognize it, um, mm -hmm. that women do need to be on the board and do contribute significantly um, and want to do something about it to speak to what you just said earlier, we don't, we don't jump on the bandwagon and do it. What they end up doing is they end up putting it into the diversity policy, yeah, yeah. Uh, policy and initiative. It's not a div it's not a diversity issue or, or initiative. It's, you know, it's different. I think that there's a difference, and, and maybe maybe um, both of you can weigh in on this. What is the difference between having a diversity policy and having a gender balance or female board quotas initiative? So is is there because if you put it in diversity, it gets buried into the talent pool, then, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think when you, diversity was something. Um, and the women's issue was very was in the same bucket. It was the right thing to do, the nice thing to do, and so let's do the right thing. And it's almost patronizing, you know, like let's just oh, put a bunch of people of different races and different genders and see how that works. You know, it's, it's, it was kind of like that, you know, rather than. Uh, ra but now it's like no, actually, the competitive environment requires diversity of thought to win. It, it requires that. You can't. You can't. I, you know, like we know of a company that just kept looking one way and now it's scrambling to try and save itself. Uh, Canadian They're in company. Nigeria now. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, because they kept looking at things one way. Um, um, and, and so the, the marketplace is changing and um, we actually have, uh, it, it actually is proven that you make more money this way. Like this, this, this repeating these old habits from the past is actually costing companies, uh, their ability to produce more. So it's like, a, it's a very different uh, situation. It's not just being good to people. It's like, we really have to up our productivity, which is bottom of the OECD is going to wreck my week, I'll tell you, finding that out. <laughs> um, uh, we need innovation. And, and we're, we're terrified of that because we want to be locked down and secure. We're Canada after all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we need more innovation. We need all these things. And, um, and, we, and to your point, we have this most, the most diverse population to draw from. But um, uh, un unless we actually understand that this is a business issue, this is not a we're patronizing some people who talk a little differently or look a little differently from us. It's actually a business thing. Until we get a handle on that, that we need that for our collective um, uh, prosperity, 
I don't think it's going to move. Uh, that's what I think the difference between diversity and, and this issue is. Because it's not seen as leadership. I think so. I mean, I would see diversity as um, as uh, making sure the workplace is accommodating that and that people are being hired yeah. appropriately. You know that you're not um, you're not being you're not you don't have systemic barriers to to hiring and generally to promotion. But I think you know what we're talking about here is more a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can you can see women in um, managerial positions where they can do quite well in different sectors. But when it comes to exercising power, right. there are stereotypes that, oh, don't worry your pretty little head about that. <laughs> <laughs> Still? And, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I don't know so those words. That's kind of an old-fashioned stereotype. Or you stereotype. get called other names. Yeah, I like mean, the, it's, yeah, it's like I, I there's think. There's name calling that happens. So yeah, it's, it, I, I think that there are still those negative stereotypes. I think the good thing is, and I think maybe partly we saw this in the recent U.S. election, mm -hmm. is that things are changing with young people. Yes. yes. Um, first of all, there's greater diversity, but secondly, I, I think they just expect diversity and they expect that men and women will be treated uh, I, I, I don't want to be bucolic about it. I don't think they're necessarily assuming equality on everything, but I, I think they do assume a level of respect that their parents did not assume. And whether that's going yeah. to translate, uh, I mean, I think the point of the discussion today is do you actually have to drive that with mandatory measures? Correct. Right. That's yeah. the issue. Yeah. And I've been looking at that from the from a parliamentary perspective and it gets i think more complex because you bring in the vote like it's the people are elected right as opposed to appointed on a board it's almost easier on a board if you make a decision you're going to have uh, a target of a certain number of women you can do that Should be is able this to a discussion that. at all is is female board quotas Bouncing around somewhere in a, in the halls of Ottawa. Well, that's a good question. That is a good <laughs> that question. That is a I good question. About that. Uh, not <laughs> that I am aware of. What we do talk about is the representation of women in Parliament. In Parliament, right? And what you know, what measures can be done to increase the representation in Parliament. And as you said, I'm a founding member mm -hmm. of Equal Voice, which which is dedicated to electing more women to mm -hmm. political office. And so we have this debate regularly about how you increase the number of women who are elected and uh, how you advocate for them. And, and I've got a lot of ideas about that. But I don't hear parliamentarians talking about the representation on board. Share one idea with us as what you have to do that. Um, well, probably. Just before we break. Okay. Well, one idea is. Um, is uh, making sure you've got women candidates, changing the rules for the nomination of women candidates to ensure that you have women running for the At nomination. All, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been tried and true, it works, it's how I got nominated, and um, so I can talk more about that. Yeah, and so that kind of uh, speaks to what you were saying, to changing the rules of how to get women on the board, because there's certain rules that you need to it, well, exactly, right. and, and, and where I'm coming from really is I want more women in senior management. And I think until there's more women on boards, you're not going to have more women in senior management. Like I, I'm actually coming from, I'd like them running the companies. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's got to be, the, the log jam is at, yeah. is, is at the board level because um, I don't know how candidates are considered for board. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, I know how they are, but I mean, I don't know how um, if anyone's saying, you know what? I'd like to just look, I'd like to look at a pool that includes fifty percent women before we actually pick our next director. I, I don't imagine what that I, would I, do for oh. political representation as yeah. well, because you'd have all yeah. these women at senior levels of business, community organizations, yeah. and uh, what what a talent pool to draw from for electoral politics. Exactly, yeah. and what a culture it would create broadly—a corporate culture, yeah. but a Canadian culture that it would create as well. Like, yeah, no, it would be. Uh, Wow, good. D good discussion for the first part. So we are going to take a short break, and when we return, Peggy, Shirley, and Shirley 
uh, we'll answer your questions. Uh, don't go away. This is Corner Office. The future of meetings and events as a business builder and leadership intervention tool is not about going just to talk. It's actually going to do something. Dealing with corner office, one thing that where I thought this found huge value, and this was the preparatory work. Getting people to uh, to trust, and uh, well, I call it going deeper with them, because if, unless you can get them to go deep, you don't get out what they're really thinking, and you don't get out the really good ideas, and you don't get out the, the, the whole purpose for, for having the collaboration. Having the, the live people here and the online and, and having the both both brought in, I really like that as opposed to just having online or just having live. And uh, they actually walked us through a whole process and asked us some tough questions. If you're going to be put in front of a camera and they ask you, you know, why do you exist, I th thought that was just a stroke of brilliance. An, an idea for them to take away, like some of this, take some of this brilliant conversation and this is how you might consider beginning to apply it slowly mm -hmm. into what you do in your do daily life in one small thing to get them to start shifting. This arrangement was very conducive. This is Corner Office and we are live from Kingbridge Collaboration Institute in King City, Ontario. I'm Susan Radojevec in conversation with our special guest Peggy Nash, NDPMP, and Shirley Knight, a consultant on leadership and organizational development. We are continuing our conversation on female leadership in business and politics part two in our women's series. So just before we broke away, uh, we were having a really great discussion about how the government is not talking but needs to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> government not really? talking. Hmm, <laughs> we talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but needs to talk about this issue and, and uh, from a governance standpoint of view as that Shirley believes very strongly that this needs to come from the top down. You need to get more women on the board on in the order board. to drive more women in leadership roles. Senior roles. Senior yeah. roles. Mm -hmm. So um, a question that came through, which kind of speaks to the to, to this quite well, is how would you respond to people who say female board quotas is a token gesture? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think the implication with that question is that there aren't qualified women out there. And I, it's an I, assumption. It's an the, assumption. Yeah, that's the assumption of that. Yeah. And I, I just disagree with that. Uh, there's lots of qualified women out there, and I, I see it in politics where there are lots of women who run for elected positions, and the ones who win do an amazing job, and there are lots of wonderful candidates who run and don't win. You know, I, I used to hear in politics that, um, well, we don't want a woman candidate in that riding because a woman can't win. And what we've shown repeatedly is women can win and can be reelected and can play a heck of a role in parliament and in government. So it, that, was, that was just a phony argument. And it's the same with, with corporate boards. It's the implication is women aren't qualified. Um, I mean, can you find unqualified women? Of course you can, but there, uh, there's a vast array of very qualified women. And the, you know, yeah. the, the question is, how do we get them on these boards and get them into politics as well? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's really true. Um, the, the, the token thing is, um, uh, is, is, that's a standard argument. You know, that's the, you know, we'll do token this, and that's all it is is a token gesture. Um, but they, I was reading this thing with Deloitte's um, uh, yesterday the, the, about the rule of three. And one woman on the board is a token. There's no question that that's a token for sure. Two women on the board is a presence. Three women is a voice. So it's getting, you're, so you're like your 30%, assume a 10-person board. It's you know, basically the numbers work out to mm -hmm. what you were saying about government, 30%. But um, so it isn't a token to build a voice. 
That isn't the token. It's a token to pick one woman and put it and say, okay, check it off the list. Good, we're done now. Let's get on with the real job. Um, that's tokenism. But, but to actually want to build a voice and critical mass that is rep representative. I, you know, they found out that Expedia, I don't know if this is old information, it might be your old, but they, they, ha they have no women on their board. I mean, are you kidding me? Everyone, mm -hmm. like 80% of all travel decisions are made by women. I, and like, why would you invest in a company that's that <laughs> crazy? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You don't have your market at the table? Like, that's just, that's just insane. So if it's, if it's not uh, a token, um, some people perceive it to be problematic by implementing board quotas that it will cause other problems. It seems to me like, for me, from, from my perspective, it seems to be that it's a perception that needs to change, yet there really isn't a need to change. There's, it, there's a perceived need that there isn't a need to change. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Does there you go. Does that make sense? It's you easy know? for you to say. So yeah. it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it seems to me, so, so what's, why would quotas um, in some cases be problematic? Would quotas be problematic and, and would be probably pro problematic for those people that don't want their perspective changed? I was going to say, it's definitely yeah. problematic if the status quo is working for you exactly. and you don't want to change. Exactly. So no, if me and my buddies are all swell just as we are, yeah. um, you don't want to, you know, for people who don't want to change, that's, that's a problem. But I find it fascinating that some of the most successful economies, um, you know, Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm, yep. some of the successful European countries, although that's getting harder to find, <laughs> but some of those countries are, are moving to a requirement for gender representation. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, you know, these are, these are countries that maybe are known for being more egalitarian. Yeah. They, they have better representation in politics, and probably that's where these board quotas are coming from, is they have more women in politics, and they're saying, well, in the private sector, maybe we have to make that mm -hmm. change as well. And could it be population driven too? Norway, I don't know what the population of Norway is. Maybe it's a smaller population, you know, much They're easier. They're about five million. Are they? Yeah, yeah, five million. And I, and I think, I th yeah, that's true. And I, and I think your point on egalitarian is, um, is, uh, is a strong point. I mean, I think they culturally, it, it doesn't surprise me that it started with the Scandinavian country because they, they have less of that. What shocked me was that Belgium and the Netherlands are behind Canada in the, in the number. So that's what shocked me in the delayed report. Um, but I think that uh, what's happening in Europe is they're, they're understanding diversity on a really large scale. I mean, how many countries are there in the EU? And they have to find ways to agree on giant issues like fiscal, monetary policy, all kinds of things. Is that working for them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so all of a sudden, like one point of view isn't going to cut it. And, yeah. you know, and so I think that's, I think that's where the incentive's coming. Um, I, I'm not for government involvement at all. I, 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 more government is not, like that would be, I, I, I get a little Mitt Romney when it gets, <laughs> <laughs> shoot me now. But, uh, but, um, but I think that, um, you know, uh, the, there was a saying um, once about DOS. Remember DOS, the operating system yeah. in the computer? You couldn't change DOS from inside DOS. You had to, for anyone to change actual DOS, you had to go outside DOS and stimulate it to, to, and do something to make it change. A blinking green light. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the screen of death, but yes. never mind. <laughs> Long memories. But, um, but I think this is the case here. And this is why, although I, would, I don't always look to government, in fact, I rarely look at government for, for the solution. I really believe that business is business and, and, it, and it can work. But this mm -hmm. is a case, I think we've got a little bit of DOS going on, an operating system on governance that is, has not been touched. And I think the only way it can be touched is from the outside. And then now I start to look at government. You know, and Even surely, but just on, on that, you know, Canada, in terms of the representation of women in politics, in our elected representation, we are 40th in the world. Oh, gosh. 40th. Oh, that's So horrible. if that doesn't kind of Sober make a up. bit of a downer <laughs> for the day. <laughs> really? So I like personally think there oh is God, really? a connection yeah. between the lack of representation of women 
in our parliaments mm -hmm. and city councils okay. and the lack of representation in the private sector. And, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, where we've seen governments mm -hmm. implement changes, boards have made the change. Now, I'm sure there are examples of boards that today are wonderful and diverse. For sure. And, you there know, there are, are those. 6% um, of the companies that have women CEOs and, uh, you know. 30 of them. 30. There's 30 gals. <laughs> there's um, 30 gals out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we are 40th in the world. There are many other wow. governments that are far ahead. And, and yes, many of them are European, but some of them are African and Asian. Yeah. I mean, we wow. had a woman prime minister very, very briefly. Shortly, very shortly. Very yeah. briefly. You know, I mean, yeah. I think of... You know, I was in a, a different, different political stripe for me, but Margaret Thatcher, Indira mm -hmm. Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, Benazir Bhutto, there are many countries, not always, you know, the kind of Western democracies or Western advanced countries that, that have that kind of representation. So we're far behind. We are oh, far behind. So could it, could it be that, um, you know, in my opening I said that there's going to be one billion women in the, market, in the global mm -hmm. marketplace from both developed and industrialized and developing nations. So could this shift in, in uh, having women on boards happen as a result of what you just said from driving it from the outside, being driven by developing nations? So to, to some respect, um, having more women on boards and in, par in parliament, in, in politics, in developing nations, hmm. because we're coming to become a global village, um, forcing the industrial nations to actually really step up? <laughs> it's an interesting know. perspective. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> you know, one thing that we know. talk about a lot at, um, in electoral politics is that countries that have different voting systems tend to have better representation. So, for example, uh -huh. it, where you have proportional representation, um, you can you can say, well, we want to make sure that a minimum of 30% of our elected representatives are women, or 40%, whatever. Um, whereas in the kind of Westminster style politics, that's more difficult to do because it's a riding-based yeah, right. parliament. Yeah. And so in the UK and in Canada, we tend to have lower representation of women, yeah, partly because of our political system. Our system, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, ladies, we can continue forever and ever, but I think um, we're, I'm going to give the, the last word to the two of you to, if you have anything else that you want to share, because um, we're, we're, we've ran a little bit long, even with our little interruption, but uh, <laughs> what would, okay, I'm going to ask um, Shirley, what would you say to a politician <laughs> <laughs> that I was in grade three with. <laughs> <laughs> you were in grade three with, yes. Uh, and, and, and I understand um, some uh, cheerleading happened there too. Yeah, cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Stop um, the camera. <laughs> uh, what would you say to a politician that um, to encourage the government of Canada to uh, consider exploring this female board quotas? Um, well, I would say, you know, what I, what I hope I've said, but I, but I, I would say that um, I really believe there's a role for government here, and I really believe that the dialogue at the government level would be profoundly useful in, uh, in, for the corporate world. And um, I know of a situation, which I won't get the details to because it was at the bank, but I know of a situation where a prime minister called the CEOs of the banks and said, change what you're doing or I'll make you. And they changed what they were doing like that. So they didn't have to be made to no, do it. No, <laughs> they just had to know that someone was like, they're, now they're, they're accountable here. And if you don't, there are consequences. And so I'm not saying, I wouldn't say to government, I want you to have a great debate about 40% uh, legislation boards by 2018. But, um, but the fact that the conversation's alive and that you would even contemplate quotas, I think, would make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think that would be enough, just that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're also making the point that uh, leadership at the top can drive change. 
Yes, absolutely. And if it, they set the tone. They set the tone, and if it becomes mm -hmm. a priority, you can send that signal, and you don't need those, uh, you know, the guillotine to yeah. enforce something. No. You can say, here's the expectation, just as you said, Shirley, that if you don't do it, we'll be forced to legislate it. Yeah. But here's what we want to see happen, and then hold them to account, yeah. I think could make a tremendous difference. But what I'm taking away from this discussion is that in addition to our discussion in Ottawa about how do we increase the number of women who are elected, uh, is that we also need to be talking about how do we make sure that we have that kind of representation and the voices of women in equal numbers on our boards across the country. That would be fabulous. That would be wonderful. So maybe <laughs> a year from, or a couple of years from now. Yeah, let's, not let's a year meet from again. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing a couple three of years from two. now. We can yeah. see uh, how, we are, how we're, how we're doing. doing. Maybe we've raised more than third. Maybe we'll have 35 or 40 women. <laughs> yeah, <there you laughs> 55. <go>. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, both Peggy Nash and Shirley Knight, for being in Corner Office today. This episode will be available for viewing next week on our website, theperegrineagency.ca. If you have thoughts on today's show, go to our website and click on the agency blog and post your comments. Find us on Twitter, our hashtag is CEOLive, or follow at Peregrine Agency or me at Susan Radojevic. Thank you, Maria, Aaron, and Hugh, our Corner Office production team, and a big shout out to our sponsors and partners coming up on your screen. Check them out. And last and certainly not least, Thank you for your participation today and patience. For Corner Office, mm -hmm. I'm Susan Radojevic, logging out. <laughs>